Plus One Forward, the podcast powered by the apocalypse, where we talk about tabletop role-playing games using or inspired by the apocalypse engine. I'm your MC, Rich, and I'm joined by my co-MC, Rach Shelke. Hey, Rach. Hey, Rich. Thanks for having me on again. Oh, well, have you on. You're, like, part of it. This is us. It's true. This episode, we're talking to the majority of folks who are in PBTA games. The players. That's right. You MCs. You can listen if you want, but we're not really talking to you. Unless you want to listen because you're an MC and you should be super curious. Well, we're also not talking about you, so don't get really stressed out about that. True, true. So, yeah, if if that was why you were thinking about listening in, sorry, we're not talking about you. No gossip. <laughs> we polled the Gauntlet community on Google+, and if you're not a part of that community, you totally should join us. It's free. We asked them some questions about playing PBTA games. What concerns do you have? What doesn't quite click for you? we got a number of great questions, and in this episode, we're going to tackle four of them. There were way more than four, but these are the four that we wanted to start off with, and we may revisit this later. Yeah, there was a lot of great questions and ideas that we looked at and said, well, we could dedicate a whole episode to just these concepts, but we don't have enough time right now with the holidays coming up, so maybe in the new year. Indeed. In fact, spoilers, principles and agenda for players, that is totally going to be an episode in 2018. Oh yeah, that's holiday homework. (laughs) All right, so let's lead off with the first question for tonight. This was submitted by David Lafreniere, who's a co-host of Discern Realities and a standing member who runs tons of games for the gauntlet. He asked, what sets being a player in PBTA apart from being a player in another system? So my thoughts, a player in a more conventional RPG is expected to, uh, this is a phrase I love I heard once before, to sit behind the eyes of their character. Do you mind expanding that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the idea that you are playing in first person, you're thinking internally, you only have power over what is inside the skin of your particular character. Oh! And it's really just about your character. Like, you're focused on your character's wants, needs, drives, their history, and you can be a giving player. Like, you can be an awesome in a more conventional RPG, an awesome person at the table. There's no slant on that, but that that point of view is what I have noticed in more conventional RPGs. And actually, from a personal note, this has been an evolution that I went through And I'm currently seeing my wife go through as she's played Dungeon World. Uh, Now she's currently in a Monster Hearts game. We're transitioning to a Masks game. So she's three games in. We're about to start Threadbare. And a lot of the aspects of PBTA that we'll talk about in just a second are really new for her and slightly uncomfortable. Because as a more conventional player, your work is in learning the ins and outs of your character's abilities, your stats, your powers, their flaws, all those kind of cool bits. You know the mechanics of the game. You understand the flow of combat. That's what you need to master in more conventional RPGs. Are there any aspects of more conventional RPGs that you feel are really important for a player? Well, the the idea that was coming to mind was I was once told by a GM of a traditional system the idea of Nothing is real for your character unless it's on your sheet. Mm. So you can write whatever fascinating backstory. You can harbor any thoughts or dreams of what your character is or could be, but they aren't real until they have a representation on the sheet. And that is a very, I think, traditional or more mainstream concept, as opposed to what we see with Powered by the Apocalypse games and their fictional flexibility. Absolutely. In fact, there's a lot of times when I hear or see a Kickstarter, I hear from someone, we've got a 500-page book. That's because, yeah, you have to lay out the world, right? It only exists if it's on the page. Yeah. Like, that's a bonus. Oh, yeah, it's it's 350. Oh, we've just added 100 more pages to Blue Rose. I'm like, oh, my God. But that's a big thing selling point for folks that were backing Blue Rose during the Kickstarter. I remember people were like super excited about that. Yeah, and I think that's something that's part of the role-playing community is there is always a negotiation in terms of how much the player is paying attention to what's going on mechanically at the table as opposed to how much the player is just spending time inhabiting that world. And I know 
some people in the community who love reading through those setting books because that's where they feel like they can inhabit that world is in that moment, you know, fixating on the history or various locations. Right. And you see often that these games will kick out their own fiction line. You know, I remember reading Dragonlance novels, reading, I'm sorry, but the Drista Erden novels <laughs> will start off as big Wolfgar fanfic, but then it evolved. You know, I really loved that. I couldn't imagine an apocalypse world fiction, right? Just, I don't, I don't see how you can make it happen because apocalypse world is different every time the play group engages with it. Well, I think the apocalypse world novel I would write based on my experience would be like really different from what you wrote. And I think there might be a danger in terms of having those books out there, not saying we shouldn't, as someone who wrote an Urban Shadows novel <laughs> <laughs> that exists only on my hard drive, but I could see there being a concern that someone would read, you know, a book based off Monster of the Week or Urban Shadows or Apocalypse World and then get the idea of, oh, this is what this game should be, as opposed to this being a facet of what this game should be. Exactly. Like, I remember on a Darkling playing which is my single favorite World of Darkness novel. Like, you read that, you really know how things, quote-unquote, should work in the World of Darkness mm -hmm. and vampire fiction. But in Apocalypse World, if I, if I read that novel, it could lock in and close out aspects of exploration that would be open to me if I effectively kind of remained loose and allowed the apocalypse at the table to develop in whatever way the group collaboratively mm -hmm. creates. Because in the majority of PBTA games, players need to think outside of their own skin. Uh, there will be moves where you have to read or assess the situation or read a person, and the answer that the MC will give you can vary between what your character would see or hear or feel or grasp to possibly just information that is directly delivered to the player. And then it's your job as, as a player of a PBTA game to take that fiction and pull it into how your character makes choices and reacts to it. So you have to kind of work on a little bit of a meta level, thinking about the fiction and the story as a whole and not just how your character is going to react. And it's freeing, but it can initially be a little intimidating because there's a, a wider scope for you. In the majority of PBTA games, players have to choose results from pick lists, which means you roll and then you have to choose from a list and you don't get all the things in the list. In, the, in my opinion, the best moves are the ones where you want all the things from the list but you're not going to get all those things from a list. And so you have to make narrative choices about the results of your own move. And you have to think at that different layer. Yeah, you have to choose where to take the hit. Exactly, because the sweet spot of the game is all about player characters getting most of what they're after, but knowing they can't have it all. You can take down the big bad, but that might end up throwing off an entire community and putting them into a downward spiral. It's about that moment when you get most of what you're after and what do you do next? To me, that's what really sets it apart. What about you, Rach? Well, when you were describing it, I was thinking about the sprawl and their uh, cashing out a mission move where the beautiful pick list is, yes, everything you want to have going right and nothing will always go completely right. You have to pick where you're going to fail or what risk that you want to interact with going forward. I think uh, what sets Powered by the Apocalypse apart from other games being a player, is just the narrative toolkit is what I would call it, to use a fancy term, is there are more tools and more ways for you to grasp the fiction and redirect it. You aren't married to the idea that the MC has an adventure and you're here to experience the story the MC is telling. It's mm -hmm. more of a collaborative storytelling system or a collaborative narrative system, if you want to spin it that way where yes, the, the MC can put challenges in your way and you may fail, but you oftentimes get to decide the terms of your failure. Or, well, sometimes you don't get to, but those are also interesting because you get to choose how you respond. Right. Like, I'm after all of this stuff, but I'll accept this one part of it and know that the MC is going to interpret those things that I'm willing to walk away from within that move. I love that. 
Yeah, and oftentimes I think with Powered by the Apocalypse, the boring answer can be you get a 10 plus. It's like, <laughs> oh, well, it happened. <laughs> yeah. Like, but I want the seven and nine. There's some interesting things here. I want to try to escape a scene and run into something worse. That sounds great right now. This is boring. I'm getting out. <laughs> exactly. Make it worse for me, GM. <laughs> well, let's jump to question two, Rach. This question comes from Matthew Doughty. What strategies and practices do you employ as a player in a Powered by the Apocalypse game to set the other characters up for success? So we've talked about how the player position is a little bit different. Shared success at the table. The stock answer I was going to go with is be a fan of the other characters. Oh. Uh, but, I'm, <laughs> but I'm willing to bet everyone listening was expecting that answer. So let me go into a little bit more detail. I thought this question was interesting because it reminded me of this odd type of move that you see a couple of times in Apocalypse World, and it shows up in a few other Powered by the Apocalypse games, where you need to consider how you help other characters succeed. And so these moves don't... I don't want to say these moves don't work, but these moves can be a little bit of a struggle to get functioning at the table. Uh, and I think this is a great way we can talk about strategies and practices in terms of supporting each other. The best example of this move, and if you all have your Apocalypse World rulebook, turn to the Savvy Head character sheets and look up the move often or right. When a character comes to you for advice, tell them what you honestly think the best course is. If they do it, they take a plus one forward to any rolls they make in the doing, and you mark an experience circle. So, which, like, I know for me, this move has, like, this great evocative image to it. Like, I could think of movies and books and TV shows where this scene plays out, right? Right. Absolutely. Happens all the time. Now, trying to make this work at the table has always been a challenge. And there's a couple other moves like this. When I put them on my character sheet, I'm like, oh, I can just envision how awesome this scene is going to be. And then they never happen. Nope. Nobody comes to me for advice. I have the savvy head. I'm often or right, but everyone goes everyone else and tries to force their own way. So you're in a Powered by the Apocalypse game, and you know that either you or some of your own players have these unusual moves that require the other players to approach you to fictionally trigger. Let's consider how do you make this process easier. My first point of advice would be get a character notebook. So go to the dollar store, just buy any notebook. And this is your character notebook. And this is where you're going to keep campaign notes. I sometimes have issues with short-term memory. Like my memory is, or my mind is usually working a couple steps ahead. So if someone tells me something, I'll be like, oh, don't worry, I'll remember. And then two minutes later, I'll be like, oh crap, I don't remember. So I need to <laughs> jot down notes. And usually in my notebooks, I will jot down the character names and notes about these types of moves, these mechanics they want me to interact with because unfortunately that move is going to be on their playbook and not on a fancy little sign in front of them saying hey come to me for advice or in, in the context of i believe it's like the quarantine has the one where someone rolls history with you so if they help or hinder then they get to mark experience again we aren't going to naturally think of it because we're going to focus on what's our our sheets and once you have sort of a quick note, think about, actively think about how are you going to bring those fictional triggers to the table. Look for opportunities to play around with those moves, to approach other players. Maybe you, you know, you aren't the savvy head. You're at a table with a savvy head and you realize your character has a crisis and doesn't know the decision. That's when you go to the MC and say, hey, I would like to frame a scene with the savvy head. We need to have a moment where this is going to fictionally happen. Not only that, think tactically, right? You're going to get a plus one if you go into that. Plus ones in this game are pretty darn significant. So if you've got a minus one in, in hard and you know you're about to roll up on somebody, go ask the savvy head for some advice. And if they say, hey, go do that thing, then you just flatten it out to where you're a zero. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like percentage wise, you're doing yourself a whole lot of good that way. You can break the game and stack your points a little bit if you really want to. Um, and I know that 
again, with Powered by the Apocalypse, we do encourage people sometimes to not think very tactically. We encourage them to think, roll fiction forward, but consider the mechanics that are going to help the fiction roll forward. Mm -hmm. By doing this, you want to create a culture at your table where your players trust each other, because that can be another barrier. Not all Powered by the Apocalypse games, hashtag not all Powered by the Apocalypse games, (laughs) but... Some of them do encourage slightly antagonistic relationships between players at the table. Monster Hearts, for example, is one of these games where you don't have friends. You have essentially tools. Players at the table and their characters mostly exist to help you fulfill your objectives. Right. There are some games that do support the idea of having a whole party that functions and plays together nicely, but not all of them do. So it can be a little trepidatious. Because, again, Apocalypse World is one of these games where there's a little bit of inherent mistrust. And we should take the moment every once in a while to take a step back and go, my character might be a selfish jerk that really just wants to use all these people as a means to the end. I, the player, am not my character. I can use my character to, you know, fulfill whatever. But as a player, I should be consciously aware of how we're interacting at the table and how other people are feeling. If there is a player who is a little bit quiet or a little bit reserved or not getting enough screen time, reach out to them in character. Think long and hard. If my character is a manipulative asshole, how can I bring this character along for the ride? The example I love citing, and before we go here, warning, I do not suggest you actually do this. What I did was really mean and nasty in retrospect, but I was younger and sillier at the time. I had a convention game of Tremulous that was really kind of boring. And there was five of us at the table, and two characters were getting a lot of screen time, a lot of attention from the MC. I was tied to one of the big plot points. And I had two other players, one of which was a stranger, one was my fiancé, and they had nothing to do. And they just sat there and got progressively bored, like, or progressively more and more bored. So I said to myself, um, if I'm going to have to stay here for another hour and a half, I'm going to have a fun time. So in character, my character got a car, literally drove up to these people while they were walking down the street. And out of character, say, get into the car, we're going to drive to where the plot is. (laughs) And spent this time focusing on the character, these characters saying, hey, so how are you feeling about this really weird situation? Let's go to this cottage in the middle of nowhere where a person who's dead gave me a phone call. Obviously, this is the interesting thing we should totally go see. Again, in retrospect, I probably should have told the MC what I was doing because I kind of derailed his game hard. He was totally okay with it. The, the two other players, my fiance, of course, was really happy, but the stranger who I had met at the con was just like, you know, this was the best time he had. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> was, you know, there was this big thing happening, and I was focusing the spotlight on him. And it was partly my means to the end, character-wise, because I wanted to resolve this character thing. But I think he was playing a soldier or something like that. Oh, he had a blast. But uh, <laughs> don't derail too hard, kids. <laughs> well, you know, this is a little broader than just PBTA, but I really mm-hmm. feel that as a player, you're part of this group, right? It's your responsibility to look out for the other player characters in the game. And I think from that perspective, Rach, what you did was good. Checking in with the MC, definitely <laughs> a <better>. good <laughs> step. And you you will do that, you know. And the future. You know to do that now, right? It, I mean, you already... I think you made overall... Like that intent, that instinct is great. And I strongly encourage it in anybody at my table. And that's something I want to do when I'm sitting at a table. There have been a number of times when the MC will look to me and I'll say, we haven't heard from so-and-so in a while. What's going on with them? Like I'll just, even if the MC directly asks me a question or tries to engage with my scene, I'll step back and say, I really haven't like this person looks disengaged. They're bored, but I'll, I'll throw the ball to them. Yes. Say, well, I'm really curious what's going on with that person. And, and maybe I should check in with the MC beforehand, but I like, 
sometimes you just do that live and you do it with respect and you do it with as much affection as you can for your fellow players and you just roll with it. Like there's only so much check in time you can have in a three to four hour con slot. Exactly. And with the games that are a little bit separate, so ones that don't have functional parties, so picking up off my head, Urban Shadows is a great example of this. Sagas of the Icelanders often functions like this when I've been playing it. Apocalypse World are often about people who aren't necessarily doing the same thing at the same time, but are usually within earshot of each other, or at least a short walking distance. And you could easily say, oh, what am I doing, MC? I'm going to walk over to where so-and-so's character is, because I want to see what they've been doing, because they haven't been on screen for a while, so they should be up to something. Yeah. Anything more you wanted to say about our second question there? I think another, uh, like, just sort of a final note on it is uh, those dangerous phrases in role-playing is my character wouldn't do that. Mm. And this is a general role-playing thing. Think of why your character would do that or what circumstance would put your character in a position that they would do that or engage the thing. Don't block people's... I mean, if it is a problematic idea that someone's approaching you with, you should block it. But if it's someone who is doing something that's a little bit off kilter or something you hadn't considered, your idea that you're holding your head might not necessarily better. Just go along with the ride, or for the ride with it. That leads perfectly into our next question, actually. Question number three. Question number three was submitted by this gentleman by the name of Rob Diabold, who I've heard is on this podcast called It's Like D&D. Yeah, apparently it airs seasonally. Nice. His question is, what should I be doing during other players' scenes? Listening? Give nonverbal feedback? Throw popcorn? Cheer? Jeer? Laugh? Groan? You are an audience. When you're not on stage, you're a part of the game. You're still an audience. Another thing that you can do as a player during other players' scenes is think about what's going on. Be ready to jump forth with suggestions because pulling the table is absolutely a valid thing that an MC can do. It's a thing that a player can do. I've done it many times. I'll hit a wall at times. Where I just, I can't think of a really cool thing to do right now. And oh yeah, around. randomly call on someone. What's the worst thing that can happen right now? Absolutely. Be ready for that. Be thinking about the cool stuff. Don't think as in, I'm going to take over and make it go that way. But it's like you're watching a TV show where maybe every once in a while there might be a Twitter poll where you can answer, right? That's a thing that you can do as a player that's really effective. Think about if they walk up to me, what is my character going to react to this? You talked about a notebook. Yes. And I think that's specifically awesome. Listen to what the other PCs are after. What are their goals? How can your character intersect with their motivation or with the person that they're after? Find ways to be part of that story. Be a fan of their characters. Let your character be willing to intersect, to integrate, to be a part, to step in, to help, or in some games, to hinder. Right, Because that can be exciting too. I often get nervous when a player feels like it's their job in a game that has shared authority that they should step forward and be the villain. And I've seen that in oh, some story games. Oh, yeah, that's not good. So I would not I would never encourage someone who is a player to feel that they need to be the opposition to the other player characters. I have seen it pulled off in an exemplary fashion, but I've also seen it set a table on edge. And so that's not where I would encourage people to find their fun unless they've checked in with the other player characters. Like, I have an open question of, is this the point where Doghead turns on you guys? And if you get a bunch of nods, go for it. There are a couple games that are meant to put that sort of sensibility on edge Space Worm versus Moonicorn is one of them, mm -hmm. where you have two players who represent these. They're not really antagonist and villain. The best example I can think of uh, is Rob himself. When we were driving to Queen City Conquest one year, we were listening to the soundtrack to Hamilton. And Rob said, oh, in the first act, Washington is Space Worm and Hamilton is Moonicorn. Hamilton being the young idealistic rebel and space worm being someone who controls a lot of power and authority and has a vision for how the world should change. So they're kind of on a spectrum 
But you have the other player characters who are constantly in conflict, shifting back and forth to where they sit on the spectrum that can cast one side in a slightly more antagonistic role one session, but then everything can shuffle back the same way. Or mm-hmm. sorry, everything can shuffle back the other way in a different session as the story changes. Mm-hmm. Most games don't have that level of thought in terms of the party build. And I, I have seen games that, I hesitate to use the word explode, but definitely falter and struggle when someone decides, oh, I'm the bad guy. I am more exciting, compelling it as the bad guy than anything the MC could bring to the table, which is really weird and strange. And I wish I understood the thought process that leads to that. I, I think it's a lack of trust in the MC. At least that's what I've seen in conversations that I've had. And just like the MC is a fan of your character in Empowered by the Apocalypse game, you as a player need to trust in that. I think that the whole rocks fall, the party dies, the, the memes of like be nice to your DM, <laughs> all of those things. Like let's let's put those aside for Power by the Apocalypse. Let's understand that we're all here to tell a story together, and when the MC comes with a hard move, it's not because they want to cackle behind their non-existent screen at your lack of ability or the fact that the dice were all traitors to you (laughs) is because they're a fan of your character and the challenge is what's interesting like those down points where you climb your way back up or when you're forced to make a decision that maybe this isn't worth that struggle and you find a different path that's interesting Yes, in fiction, there's one of the critical moments that often occurs is when the hero is caught on their own and everything is stacked against them and no one who can validate them as the hero is watching, what does the hero do? Because that says so much fictionally about your character. It's not about winning all the time and how badass you are at winning. It's about when everything is pushed against you and everything sucks. What do you do? How do you respond? And that's just as important as how do you stop across the battlefield and win a victory of no challenge. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, to close it off, last thought is find ways to be integrated with other player characters, stories, or to overlap with the things that they are doing as much as possible. If you're ambivalent, find ways to care. (laughs) <laughs> especially in apocalypse world because it's about scarcity and so if they're after water and water's one of the scarcities why aren't you after water what's wrong with you if there's not enough water <laughs> right what's going on well, there well my character is part lizard and is storing a water reserve and it's fail obviously we need to chop off your character's arms and legs every once in a while for food thank you go look at fans in general and see how they obsess over parts of characters and and I have a fan background, could I so I could easily sort of suss out, oh, this is a super cool thing about this character. This is a super cool thing about that character. That's what you really need to be paying attention to at the table. One hundred percent. All right. Well, we are up to our fourth question, Rach. Our fourth and last question. A little drum roll. What is Okay. Our last question, which was suggested by Misha Krilov, was how do you best engage HX slash strings slash bonds? slash inter-PC mechanics. Whoa, Rich, that one's a doozy. Yeah. Wow, I can't believe you put this on the rundown, Rach. This could have been a whole episode. Why did I pick this one? Good luck with this one. Woo. I, this was one of the first ones that grabbed me, Misha. So be proud. I saw this one. I'm like, oh, we got to talk about this. And then I stared and went, oh, God, we have to talk about this. <laughs> so we need to take a step back, I think. And consider the different ways that different PC relationship mechanics can function. Some games will clump all of these fictional inter, or sorry, some games will clump all these inter PC relationships together and say, well, this is by mechanic that's similar to HX in Apocalypse World and Strings and Monster Hearts. And my knee jerk reaction is, but those are very different things but I can understand why mentally they occupy the same space for a lot of people because they're the same means to the end, right? 
Right. Yeah, they are. There are so many different relationship mechanics at this point in the Powered by the Apocalypse design community. We cannot list all of them here. We will be here all night. And they're all flavored slightly differently. So breaking them all down into this section is impossible. Even doing it in one whole episode, I don't think is going to be possible because we'd have to sit there and consider, oh, what about this game? What about that game? So let's set up with a very clear step one in terms of how do we interact with these mechanics better. Go to the rule book and look up the section that talks about the relationship mechanic that you're curious about. Consider how that mechanic is framed fictionally within the game and what it's trying to represent and how it mechanically functions. Look at the play examples because you'll get from those the best idea of how the designer is intending that mechanic to work. This seems simple, but it's absolutely the place you need to start because there is so much variety and variance at this point. Some games have relationship mechanics that are very shallow. They're really only meant to spur things off in character creation. Mm -hmm. The example I thought of was uh, Sisterly Bonds and Bluebeard's Bride. They're really only meant to set up how the sisters feel about each other and what their starting relationship is to get so the game can hit the ground running hard and fast. They serve no other purpose in the game. Similar in my experience is Masks where there's a bit of a backstory, but but then there's also an influence, which is more like the, the HX type thing, and it's yeah. just a positive or negative, but then there's still that backstory piece. So there are two distinct things, and there's no real mechanics behind those relationships. Exactly, and they serve a purpose. So saying there's no real mechanics isn't dismissing them. They are meant to create something in the fiction. It's just they don't have an ongoing mechanic. Good point, good point. So let's look at HX. Lovely starting point. I've been going back to Apocalypse World for a lot of sort of starting point references this uh, episode, I've noticed. So HX is shared history, how well one character knows another. So this comes up during character creation where you have your little HX props. So you can decide how deeply and intensely you know someone. It comes up as a stat for help and hinder. The end of session And a lot of specials, because if you're going to have a moment of intimacy with someone, you're going to know them a little bit differently than before you started. Mm -hmm. Uh, The way you engage history is mostly fictionally driven and is probably going to be a conversation with the other player when it comes up. So let's say I'm playing a Skinner and my friend Kate is playing a hard holder in our little imagined apocalypse world game, which might be based on an actual apocalypse world game. (laughs) If I want to hinder the hard holder's actions as a skinner, I'm going to be rolling my HX. My HX could be one. What does that mean? Again, knowing this is how deeply you know another character. It could mean I know enough about the hard holder to know some very socially public ideas and concepts about them. I might know that they see their hard hold as a family, and that's what keeps the hard hold together and keeps them traveling through the wilderness. My HX is three, on the other hand, that reflects a much more intimate and deeper relationship between the two characters. I might know that I broke the hard holder's brother's values of family and support, and that's why he left the hard hold, and that's why the hard holder has it out for me. It's a very different, deeper understanding of the character based on experiences than the one would reflect. So you're saying that if I have an HX of plus one, you when you play, you're going to look for a plus three to have more intimate detail about exactly. that character. That's that's a really interesting interpretation. Like I understand that, especially when you look at the things that, from character creation that create a HX plus three versus a plus one. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and especially with the like the very dismissive ones, which are get a sense of you've passed each other's uh, path at some point, as opposed to and that, the one that really grabs my imagination, I think, is one of the new driver ones, which is you saw someone stare off in the horizon. They have the same look in your eyes that you have, like that moment of unspoken understanding. That's going to be a much deeper relationship than perhaps we went out to a meal once. Right. Of course, there's always going to be some wiggle room in terms of what does this number mean. It is just a number on paper in a fictional universe. 
So HX is more of a passive mechanic compared to other mechanics like Debt and Urban Shadows, Strengths and Monster Hearts. With mechanics like that, we need to consider that they're more dependent on the players driving the use. I failed to take a step to another system with Fate. Aspects sometimes struggle depending on how hard the GM wanted to push aspects. Um, aspects, aspects being little sentence descriptions of your character that fuel part of play. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe one day on the Gauntlet we will have a Fate pl- uh, podcast that we can point people towards. Uh, but so, I guess the best piece of advice here is to do it. Do it. If you want to engage it, you got to engage it, right? Mm-hmm. There's a few steps you can take to help make this a smooth process. You can, in as I was saying, I like keeping notebooks. I like keeping notes in games. You can improve your bookkeeping skills with the mechanic. Uh, I've never seen a playbook with one of these more active mechanics have a great way to organize how it's working and how much someone has on you and how much you have on them. Yeah, so it's kind no, of I agree. Weird afterthought. I mean, even with history, it's just got a little box. Uh, strings gets really messy. That gets really messy. What I do is first thing I do on my character sheet is I set up a little grid where I write down all the characters' names. I write down roughly to my understanding how much they owe me and how much I owe them. And I do both of them because I know a lot of times with debt, you want to encourage how much you hold against someone. But I also want to know how much people are holding against me, to use the Urban Shadows example. Because with debt in particular, because I've played a lot of Urban Shadows, people seem to forget it it exists. And then, you know, you get to points where clearly this is where debt should come up. This is where debt should be invoked. And I'm sitting there going, well, I don't know how much you have on me. So is this actually how this conversation should be going? Or should we be looking at the game in a completely different direction at this point? As opposed to saying, hey, so you got too dead on me, why don't you try to cash in some debt right now and I'm going to honor that cash in and we're going to see where the fiction goes from there. Nice. That is really sharp, Rage, because it it fuels the economy of the game but it does so in a, a natural you're pulling instead of pushing. I like that. That's really smart. Well, it was great until I I, I think with whatever child's campaign, I was playing an Oracle and I was posting how much debt people had on me. And at one point I was like, oh, there's like 12 debt out to get me from various <laughs> sources. I am so fucked right now. <laughs> Truth, it hurts. Yes. And the second thing is, you know, what I said about going back and reviewing the rule book, review the moves that you could use to spend these this currency and actively consider how you want to use these mechanics to advance the game. What gets you ahead? What makes the story interesting? It's easy to overlook these inter PC moves because I think our natural instinct as players is to reach for the dice and look for something that's a basic move or something that's on our playbook. I mean, when I'm thinking, what am I doing next? That's where I go to is like, well, okay, what actually do I want to drive towards? And it's very rarely going to be an inter-PC mechanic unless I make a point to look at it. Rich, like, what's your knee-jerk reaction in terms of I'm going to move the fiction forward if I want to get inspiration? Where do you look on your move sheets? Ooh, I usually look for the ones that use my best stat. (laughs) Exactly. It's a clearer structure. Because I find with the inter-PC mechanics, it can sometimes be a little bit vague what you're actually going to get out of it, as opposed to... I'm going to make a roll on a 10 plus. I know this is going to happen. And on a 7 and 9, I know I get a pick list. Oops. On a 7 to 9, I know I get a pick list. I mean, the answer is really clear there, right? Right. Um, and so, again, it's to do it, do it. Actively consider how you want these mechanics to be part of the game. If someone tries to use a mechanic on you, for all that's holy, please don't dismiss it or joke about it or block the attempt. Because you're just encouraging a slightly more toxic culture at the table that's going to chill the environment and prevent people from using these mechanics. Absolutely. Uh, An example I can think of is when we were doing playtesting for Urban Shadows, we had a guy playtesting the wolf. And he came to the conclusion that wolves don't yield to the interests of others. We do not honor debt. And every single time someone tried to engage debt, we had to force him to roll, refuse to honor a debt. But there was no interesting fictional reasoning 
why we were doing that other than this guy was being a bit of a stick in the mud about in- interacting with the mechanic because he saw it as a form of submission, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like a really, like, there's some character choice in there, but if it never bends at all, then it's like you're just waving goodbye to an entire aspect of the mechanics. Mm-hmm. And I mean, refuse to honor that you could block, but think of a fun fictional trigger as to why you would do the block, saying someone comes to you and says, well, you owe me the debt, and you turn to them and say, no, and here's why I refuse to honor it, and then you make your roll. Not all games have a lovely blocking mechanic. Other games, the inter-PC mechanic can just kind of fall apart if people decide not to hold up the other end of the social agreement, as it were. On this big, hefty last of four questions, Rach, anything more about uh, engaging HX strings, bonds, and other inter-PC mechanics? Do you got any examples from your own play about interesting ways you've seen people interact with these? One of the things that I really enjoy in the Monster Hearts play by post, and again, part of this is the medium with which we're playing, right? Because you can write down your strings, you can Mm -hmm. write down where they came from and why they matter, is when Jen plays Ashley, she will often, when using a string, phrase that in her character's reaction. When she's spending a string to motivate someone to tempt them with an XP to do Mm -hmm. this thing. She will fold that into the fiction. And it is so nice because it's something you would see on TV. And I really enjoy that. And I know that it's it's a little extra bookkeeping, but you've already thrown out have a notebook. So we're we're there. We've already gone down that road. And I the reward for that and keeping it in the fiction and then marking that that string off seeing them mark it off on their little book, you know, or seeing it, uh, the strikeout font in the play by post is also a really great boom. This is out. We've marked it clear. You're good to go. I like that a lot. That's one thing that I really enjoy about engaging with that system on an active basis. And I think Jen does an excellent job with it. And I think you're right in highlighting that when you have to write it out, we have to sit and think about it and almost have a visual cue for, what this mechanic is, it can be sometimes easier to grasp. Because I remember reading when I was early into figuring out Monster Hearts, reading people's play by boasts, trying to make strings exist by using little pieces of string, by using little tokens, (laughs) just so uh, people did have a visual to go, oh, well, this is here and I can't unsee it because it's constantly in front of me and reminding me, oh, you can use these. There are certain playbooks you'll find across games that aren't as dependent on these mechanics, but then others that are deeply dependent on them and thus need a culture of this slightly more aware play at the table to keep them engaged. A lot of the fake characters in the urban fantasy games end up like that. Oh man. (laughs) I Promises. Yeah. Well, Rach, I feel good. I hope that our players, our audience, have enjoyed our conversation here. I've learned a good bit from you, as I do every time we record. I've learned a lot from your experiences. Well, thank you. I think you have a bunch of interesting ideas to me, things to consider. Well, that will bring this episode of Plus One forward to a close. Uh, Rach, thank you so much for walking through these four questions. And thanks for making those initial posts on social media and helping gather all these questions. And hey, did we not get to your question and you got a burning desire for it? You can let us know. Feel free to reach back out to us. If we get enough response, we'll probably circle back to the questions that we didn't get to this time around. Thanks, Rach. Thank you, Rich. Plus One Forward is a production of the Gauntlet community, Richard Rogers and Rach Schelke. You can find us at gauntlet-rpg.com or follow us on Twitter at at plus one FWD. If you would like to support our show, visit our Patreon site at patreon.com slash gauntlet. The games mentioned on this show use the Apocalypse Engine, which is a creation of Vincent and McGay Baker. The music for Plus One Forward is from the Savage Aural Hotbed CD, Gomi Daiko. The songs used are Gomi Daiko, Metal Version, and Hammer of Bill. You can find more amazing tunes by Savage Aural Hotbed on their website, www.savagearlhotbed.com.